Good morning and good afternoon, and welcome back to the 2021 Virtual PBS Leadership Forum. I'm Dr. Kelsey Morris from the University of Missouri and co-director of the Center for Schoolwide PBS at the University of Missouri. As someone who works with district leadership teams to implement and scale up PBS, I'm excited to be here with you as we kick off the district leadership strand. In order to sustain and grow effective implementation of PBS district-wide, systems and supports that build internal capacity are critical. We're thrilled to have a whole strand devoted to leading district-wide implementation, sustainability, and scalability. Here in this strand, we're going to work to illuminate and illustrate the logic of district-wide implementation and the various elements that drive effectiveness and expansion of PBS across the district. We're excited that we have multiple district leaders joining us in our sessions today to share their journey of implementation and to, to describe for us and for you how they've worked to implement, sustain, and scale PBS district-wide. Plus, we're gonna leave you with resources and ideas that you can use in your own district as you work to implement PBS. This strand is organized around the implementation drivers that you can find in the PBS implementers blueprint and which are also the organizing structure for the district systems fidelity inventory released last year by the Center on PBS. By the end of this strand, we'll have touched on almost all the implementation drivers and maps them back to the district systems fidelity inventory. So you as an attendee get a glimpse into the many facets of district-wide implementation and can better see how you as a district leader are involved in the process. We're gonna begin this strand by hearing from a panel of district leaders who will talk to us about their experiences developing district-wide systems to support implementation, how they've organized a leadership team, aligned their work with larger district goals, as well as developing the capacity of their workforce, truly all things that lead to sustainability. For our second session of the day, Dr. Heather Hatton from the University of Missouri, along with other district leaders from across the country, will talk to us about the systems and tools necessary to facilitate database decision-making across the district and at the district level. We'll wrap up our strand by hearing from Dr. Lisa Powers of the University of Missouri and a set of district leaders on their efforts for training and coaching and moving from a building level focus to a district wide process to truly support all students across all tiers. As we move through the various sessions in this strand, consider for yourself these questions. With the content that's shared, how does it compare to the priorities of your district? What team in your district would oversee this work? And as you're starting to think about bringing new practices or new strategies into your district, consider what could or should you stop doing to make room for this new work? And how will you assess whether it's being implemented well or even working to help you achieve your goals? You may have been introduced to these expectations at other sessions or in other strands of the conference. As we kick off our time together today, we'll reshare these and encourage each other to be responsible, respectful, and safe as we move through the various sessions. Whether this is your first session of the conference or you've had the opportunity to participate in others, let's quickly go over some logistics of the conference platform. You can find all the sessions that you've registered for in the conference platform under the agenda tab and my agenda. On the individual session pages, you'll be able to find the important details for the session, have a button to directly join the session, and be able to interact and engage through the chat, polls, and any files the presentation team has uploaded. You can use the chat feature in the conference platform to engage with other participants around the session topic as well as the content facilitators who are monitoring the chat and who are able to respond to questions at the right moment in time. All of the sessions for today have time set aside toward the end for attendee Q&A. You can find the Q&A under the polls section and can submit the questions you would like speakers to respond to. Plus, you even have the opportunity to upvote specific questions. Like most things online, it's possible to navigate away. So be mindful of your online activity. If you happen to navigate away from this live session, you'll need to press the join meeting button to enter back in. Even though you may still be in the conference platform, clicking on links and items outside of this session will navigate you away from the actual event and require that you rejoin to continue. If at any time you need technical support, 
Know that you can click on the help desk option that's at the top of your conference platform screen and access a support agent. Now I'd like to turn our attention to the first session of the strand, an overview and logic of district-wide implementation. We have a wonderful panel of district leaders from across the country joining us today. Today, we're joined by Danielle Starkey, who is the supervisor of the Omaha Public Schools Multi-Tiered System of Support for Behavior Initiative. We're also fortunate to be joined by Dr. Jane Crawford, who's a member of the district-wide MTSS team for the Ferguson Florissant School District, chair of the MTSS Makers team, and principal of the STEAM Academy for grades nine through 12. As well, we're joined by Renee Garcia, the new and first director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Michigan Department of Education, and who previously served as superintendent of the Muskegon Heights Public School Academy system. We also have the privilege of speaking today with Paula Regosa, who is the PBSIS coordinator and professional developer for Clifton Public Schools. While we give our panelists a moment to settle in, and before we launch into our first question, let's establish a base for today's session. Across the country, almost 30,000 schools currently implement PBS and reach more than 15 million students. In recent years, that number has steadily grown, and as schools increasingly choose to implement PBS to positively impact school climate, students' social and emotional behavioral health, it gives us a unique opportunity as district leaders to plan for expansion and sustainability. Though implementation efforts may begin with a single school serving as a model or a pilot, key to sustainability and expansion is creating a district-wide initiative that builds internal capacity for training, coaching, evaluation, and embedding behavioral expertise across the continuum. Internal capacity in these areas has been shown to be crucial for enhancing the efficiency for sustaining the work as well as transitioning implementation from one tier to the next. Ultimately, within a district, implementing at tier one alone is going to be insufficient in meeting the needs of all students. It's important for districts to recognize the value of implementing across all tiers and to dedicate the necessary resources, time, and energy to support schools in implementing beyond tier one. Each campus is going to have a population of students who need more targeted or individualized supports to achieve success. And rather than schools owning the responsibility to adopt interventions and navigate the implementation process alone, districts can establish guidelines and systems of support to move implementation forward and expand from model demonstrations to district-wide implementation. Doing so can give districts the opportunity and the advantage to design a coordinated approach for intervening early, often, and strategically. Plus, Coordination between district level departments builds awareness of PBS and can foster a greater level of alignment across different initiatives. By working to align those initiatives, programs and practices with PBS, districts can maximize resources and workforce capacity to create an early intervention framework that supports all students across all schools. Within PBS, we talk a lot about systems, practices and data. As we look at this through the lens of district-wide implementation, we think about it in terms of systems to support staff behavior. How do we align our resources and think or rethink what expertise means and what expertise is needed to create systems that support staff across the district? In terms of practices to support student behavior, we're thinking broadly, we're thinking district-wide. What is it that we do across all tiers to help students achieve and succeed? And as we're building those systems and implementing those practices, we're using data from all campuses to support our decision making as we work to move all things from good to great. Now that we've grounded ourselves, fasten your seatbelts, secure your trade tables, and let's prepare for takeoff. I'm excited to check in with our panelists today and learn about their journey of implementation. So we're going to start today with the topic of leadership teaming. It's one of the things that as you start this work, it's always gonna go back to a team. You've gotta have a team of people that are able to, what we often say, be the architects of the larger system. So in light of the base we just established and what the ultimate goal is, let's hear from our panel about leadership teams. And we're gonna to start today with Paula Regosa. Tell us a little bit about your district story and the shift to district-wide implementation and what leadership for this looks like in your district. 
Thank you so much, Kelsey. Hello, everyone. Greetings. Clifton School District educates over 11,000 students in 20 instructional settings. Our schools include two preschool programs, 14 elementary schools, two middle schools, and one high school. Our students speak 53 different languages and dialects that represent the world. This paints a demographic picture for you all, but the overall picture can be rounded out as a school district that is deeply rooted in traditions, where Friday night high school football games are still the place to be. Our PBSIS journey started in 2011 when one of our middle schools was placed on a focus priority list by the New Jersey Department of Education. The school improvement plan devised included training and implementation of multi-tiered systems of supports. In New Jersey, that state team is called New Jersey Positive Behavior Supports in Schools, and they have trained and supported our efforts all along the way. The middle school went on to implement the framework with fidelity, and um, it resulted in the removal from the NJDOE underperforming list. It was then that that it was then the consideration for district-wide implementation was first explored by the assistant superintendent of curriculum and assistant superintendent. They both made the connection that the PBIS framework would help increase overall school climate and increase academic achievement, as we all know. We were awarded the School Climate Transformation Federal Grant in 2019, and this afforded us the opportunity to move forward with this vision. Over the past year, we developed the PVSIS District Leadership Team and the PVSIS District Coaches Network to facilitate our district-wide scope. Our district leadership team includes the school, the school Climate Transformation Grant Liaison, our, um, the Director of NJPVSIS, the Assistant Superintendents, Special Education Director, the Counseling, Math, Phys Ed, and Special Ed Supervisors, building administrators, teaching staff, and parent representatives. And the reason why I lay all those out is because I thought that it was really important for you all to see who's part of our dream team. We meet monthly for an hour where the DSFI climate surveys and office conduct referral data help drive our conversations and data discussions. So this collaboration process was a learning experience, right? Especially under the pandemic. Uh, we started out reporting school implementation and training status, but now it's morphed into an authentic collaboration with everyone providing feedback and really owning the framework in their respective arenas. The PBSIS Coaches Network in the district has proved to be highly successful at achieving consistent implementation across all buildings. This is where the huge part of um, the magic happens, right? The coaches provide um, what simply works for their independent buildings. So while there's a clear expectation of what universal or um, the framework looks like in each building, they still tailor it to their particular needs. The coaches network meets monthly for an hour and then turnkeys the information to their respective building um, teams uh, monthly. The big idea that I wanna share with you all is that implementing um, district-wide will take many folks and a long time. At least that's been our journey. We've gone about implementation very slowly so that we can capture all of our stakeholders' voices, which has been the best recipe for our staff buy-in so far. The specific suggestion that I wanna leave you all on my end for this is share your success stories as often as possible. It helps promote your framework, but more often um, it, just, it just helps drive that needle. Right now we've embedded a three to five minute monthly segment at our Board of Education meeting where we showcase student staff or a school who are creatively implementing their framework. Share your success with anyone that will listen because guaranteed it will help someone along their implementation road. Thanks for listening. Um, Jane, I pass it over to you. Thank you, Paula. Hello, everybody. My name is Jane Crawford and I'm the proud principal of STEAM Academy at McClure South Berkeley in the Ferguson Florissant School District. And I'm also a longstanding member of the Ferguson Florissant School District's core team, which is what we call our district leadership team. And we um, have been 
dabbling in core team work for a little over a decade, actually. And we started many moons ago with um, a committee called Tiered Intervention Leadership Team or TILT. So we've, we've gone through many different names and many different generations of our work. And um, in Ferguson Florissant School District, uh, PBIS started as a real strong grassroots effort back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And we actually had a few elementary schools in our school district of 11,000 students who were really um, focusing on implementing PBIS and getting awards from the state level for their implementation and becoming exemplars in the state. And so that enthusiasm and those results permeated all of the rest of the of the schools in our district, which there are 22. And, um, and pretty soon this became a district initiative as opposed to simply different pockets in different schools. And, um, and so then we, we decided to try to harness and organize some of our momentum through that district teaming that I mentioned a minute ago. And so now we call um, our team the core CI3T slash MTSS team. And we also meet monthly, just like Paula's group does. We do meet for a little bit longer than an hour. We typically go about two to two and a half hours for our core team meetings. And we are divided into a variety of different subcommittees. For example, I'm the chair of what we call the makers team. And the makers team in our core team is the group that pushes out district-wide professional learning around PBIS initiatives. And there are other committees as well. There's a data committee, there is a coaching committee, there is an alignment committee, there's um, a, a variety of different um, committees that, that work with specific details of our district's um, uh, fidelity inventory. Now, granted, a lot of those do kind of cross connect as we do the work together. But um, by having those subcommittees, it really does help to like, you know, like that old expression, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time. So when everybody is in, in their own different subcommittee, it helps that they're eating a little bite of the elephant in their area and it gets, um, it makes the whole become more manageable and, and, and allows us to accomplish more. And so, um, and, and so that is the sort of the um, lay of the land in terms of how our district leadership team um, functions. I do want to give a shout out to um, all of the um, upper level district leaders who are so supportive of this work, including our current leader, Dr. Stewart, our previous leader and, and the keynote speaker from PBIS, um, Dr. Benita Jameson. And, um, and so many of the um, superintendents and assistant superintendents who've supported this work wholeheartedly um, for the benefit of the children in the Ferguson Florissant School District. All right, That's so now I'd like to pass it on to Renee. Renee, we're so excited to hear from you because I love that Jane just identified a, a key element as having those executive level leaders in support of the process. And you are an executive level leader, both now at the state level, but previously at the district level. So talk to us a little bit about kind of how you, you did this within your, your district. Yeah, absolutely. So I had the, the honor and the privilege of being the superintendent of Muskegon Heights Public School Academy system, which is a pre-K through 12th grade school system in Western Michigan with about 700 students. We're pretty small. Um, we are, we, I, I say are, I'm two months into my new position at the Michigan Department of Education. So I still feel very connected to Muskegon Heights, but so I'm going to speak in the current tense. We um, we're a school district um, that 10 years ago was um, taken over by the state, um, had a significant amount of debt and um, not performing well on the state standardized testing. And so I was not with the district at that time, 
but there's been a long time of a real disenfranchisement from the community in the schools and understandably so um, we weren't really serving the community as they deserve to be served so I joined um, six years ago in Muskegon Heights and I had come from uh, being a building principal and implementing PBIS and what I noticed when I got to Muskegon Heights I was first an assistant superintendent for a year and then became the superintendent was that we talked about implementing PBIS and people were working their tails off doing the best that they could in each and every setting, but there was a lot of inconsistencies and a lot of differences in definitions of what that looked like. So what I did was I pulled that back to a district level, created a district level team, and that team um, started to meet. We met um, every other week actually for between an hour and a half and two hours, and the teams alternated. So one week or one one time that we met, we met with our central office leadership, building leadership. So we had the principal, a dean, instructional coaches from every building. And then the next time that we met in the month, we included partners in our work. So we have a Boys and Girls Club, a mental health, um, healthcare center. So really um, incorporating an ISF um, with, with that work so that we could coordinate our services. Um, the community in Muskegon Heights is also 95% African American. And so what we were working very much to do was to layer in culturally relevant PBIS. So making sure that um, it was a system that could be embraced by our community and supported that our community felt as though um, it represented the values that they had and the desires that they had. And um, a very strong, um, invested community in tradition and very strongly invested in their children. So um, one of the things that we did was we, we worked to make sure that our agendas were set so that every month we had the opportunity to look at data and our number one goal um, was engagement. So we looked for indicators and data that would tell us that our, our families were engaged and the two that we kind of started with were attendance data and um, parent-teacher conferences. How often were our parents interacting with us with the goal of 100% parent-teacher conferences um, because we, we know that being able to um, have our parents as team members is critical and every child deserves a family member to be at the table and every family member deserves to feel welcome at the table for, for that teamwork. Um, so every, every time we met, we looked at that data and saw where we were and um, strategized around how we could do better. Um, the next section of every agenda was communication. And we built with the support of our wonderful um, ISD, so built a communication system where building level teams would share with the district level how things were going. And in that it was critical that they shared celebrations as well because we wanted to honor the work that they were doing. And so we could, we could lift that up to a district level and then also share their barriers. So they were able to tell us what was standing in their way. And we had the capacity in this, in this meeting to realign resources, whether they were people resources or financial resources to help move things out of the way so that they could implement with fidelity. Um, and then the last thing that we included in every agenda was our learning opportunity. So what was the next step we were all going to take together to make sure we were implementing with fidelity and giving teams um, opportunities to plan those, that work that they would do when they got back in the building. We tried to make those uh, meetings work sessions because we all had way too much to do, frankly, to just be given homework or assignments. So tried to develop those plans there so that then the teams could take those back and, and hit the ground running. So I think hey. we're, we're on to Danielle to share. Um, absolutely. Um, 
As Kelsey said, my name is Danielle Starkey and I'm with Omaha Public Schools in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, just to give you a little context before I kind of talk about how we got started. First off, I'm new um, within the district. So this is my first year in this role. So much of the great work I'll be speaking to happened um, prior to me. So I have to give credit where credit is due. We are a district of um, 83 schools and um, close to a dozen additional programs. In addition, we are opening five new schools over the next two years years. So within two years, we'll be right around 100 schools and programs. Um, so there's a large number of schools and programs across the district that we're providing support for. The district started implementation of what we call MTSSB, um, which is essentially PBIS in fall of 2016. It, the decision was made at that time for all schools to move forward with implementation. And so given the large number of schools and programs, it was phased in over three phases over a couple of years. Um, so by fall of 2018, every school or program in the district had received training on tier one MTSSB or PBIS. And then as schools met readiness, we've increased tier two supports. And then um, we have a small number of buildings and programs that are beginning to start at tier three. So given the large um, context that we're working in, we really have buildings that are in all different places. Um, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but it is part of our strategic plan of action that all buildings and programs within the district are implementing. Um, and it helps achieve our goal of um, an ethic of care for students and staff. We are housed currently, um, MTSSB is housed in our Student and Community Services Division. And so we have myself as the supervisor and then an MTSSB teacher leader that really lead and coordinate the work. Obviously with um, you know, close to 100 schools and programs, it takes more than us. And so within our department, we have really great support for MTSSB. And we really think about how do we leverage um, everyone in our district and all across the different departments to really support the work and support school teams. And one of the ways that we've tried to strategically support individual schools and programs is that every school and program denotes a building level coach um, for tier one and then also for tier two. And those building level coaches receive additional supports, trainings, communications, they meet monthly, um, together to collaborate across buildings and programs, and then also just to receive some additional information. So the goal is that while um, there might be a smaller number of us kind of leading the efforts at the district level, we're really building capacity within our schools and within those um, teams through those coaches to really be able to kind of bring some of the work forward. Um, so that's kind of our structure in terms of phasing schools in over time and building internal building capacity. Talk by how each of you has a completely different journey to district-wide implementation. I think that's what our audience needs to know is there is no one path. Um, and I'm also struck by how each of your districts has been doing this for several years. And that's one of the things that, you know, if, if anybody in the audience was able to come to the round table or the facilitated discussion last night, that was one of the things we highlighted is that at the building level, when we're implementing, we might think a couple of years, but when we're trying to do this work at a district level, because there's so many moving parts, pieces, and people, we think about doing it in a decade and building a 10-year plan to do this work. I'm also curious, and I'm just gonna kind of toss this one out to the whole group. So whoever wants to pick up this, feel free to pick it up and run with it. But each of you described, when, when we kind of threw that question of leadership teaming, you identified it in a yes and approach. Everybody talked about, yes, we have a leadership team, but you expanded it to talk about your internal and external stakeholders. And so we oftentimes get questions from district leadership teams going, how do we do that? What's the first step to, to bring more voices than just ours into the conversation? So I'm just going to toss that out. And How do you do this? Well, Kelsey, I can chime in. If um, For us, I think it came out of necessity. So we started to see the areas where our framework was in meeting fidelity, and we started to see our pockets in our district. Um, and perhaps, right, dare I say, our secondary tier of supports needed for those groups. 
And I think that that's how we started to identify who to, um, who to tap on the shoulder for these district leadership teams. And, um, and also, you, you know, we do the same when we, when we identify coaches for our buildings, like who are the leaders who, who would promote or cheerlead for us while still keeping it real and, and telling us what will work and what, what will not. Um, so that's, I think, what happened for us. Piggyback off of what Paula said, um, I agree. And I also think that it's a great gr growth opportunity for many people um, in the broader school district, because um, one of the things that, that I noticed that the core team has done for Ferguson Florissant has, is that it has really developed a lot of leaders in a district capacity coming from a school base because they were their strengths were noted and they were given an opportunity um, and a platform to demonstrate their skills. And you can really mine a lot of diamonds out of the process if you take the time to find those leaders and, and give them that opportunity to shine. And I would just add on that we were really working to to give the schools back to the community. It had been too long in other people's hands. And so for us to just be able to go out and we, we have so many people that were interested in joining in the work so that it was easy to find people, but then coordinating those services became a little bit more, um, more tricky to make sure that we weren't duplicating and that we were really um, capitalizing on the all of the resources so that it would really benefit the children and the families as much as possible. Karina, I'm curious, I wanna kind of tap back to something you mentioned earlier. You talked about having subcommittees and different teams and you even referenced the makers team. Yes. So can you describe a little bit about those or describe a little bit more about the different teams you have? Because I think it's so, sure interesting. Uh, I'm going to go back to what you said, you know, you're eating the elephant one bite at a time and all these teams are helping. Can you share a bit more about that? Sure, absolutely. Well, um, I am the chair of the makers team and I have a group of um, fabulous people who I work with every year to develop um, district-wide professional learning that um, everyone in the entire district participates in which helps build collective efficacy amongst your entire school district, right? And we work really hard when we're, um, we're inviting members to the maker team to make sure that we have all the different levels of schools represented and that we have um, all areas of the district represented and um, that we work with some of the other committees um, like the data committee, for example, to really focus in on what are the needs of the district and how can we best equip teachers and other um, you know, stakeholders working with children on a day-to-day -day basis with, with skills and practice what will help them to have the best outcomes for our, for our students. Um, so like, for example, our data team has been working very hard on our discipline data and it was it was um, known that we need to find some alternatives um, to suspensions and exclusionary practices for our scholars. And so the, the data team partnered with the makers team and the makers team has been working towards teaching staff how to use restorative practices on a daily basis on the ground in every school at every level in our building because our data indicates that that is a need for our children. And so, um, and so those are, that's an example of how things work together. Um, and, they're, and, they're, and they're all so interrelated, um, but, um, but nevertheless, there is work that can be done in a subcommittee group. And then you come and you pull that back together and you let everyone take a look at the outcomes or the suggestions or the next steps that other committees need to um, take. 
And I will say, I think our coaching um, subcommittee is, is kind of like our big next step. That seems like the next phase for Ferguson Florissant, what we're really going to be developing out um, as an effort to um, increase our collective efficacy district-wide. You know, you talked about working together and what it makes me think about is, you know, alignment. Lots of times we talk about alignment and each of you identified and kind of your journey to district-wide implementation that you started either because a school was in need with a specific plan or the community was just in a larger general need. And when we, lots of times we start from those places, there's, there's a lot of activity that's going on. We're trying to do a lot of different things just to move forward somehow. So I'm curious to hear from you all, you know, how did you work or how are you working to keep things to safeguard from being siloed or disconnected? What are you doing to make sure that this, this work of implementation is aligned to the larger district goals and outcomes or even other related initiatives? You know, Danielle, what's happening in Omaha? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the things that I alluded to earlier that I'll speak to now, because it's really um, kind of the basis for our alignment and integration is in our most recent um, Omaha Public Schools Strategic Plan of Action, we have a priority for related to ethic of care. And in there, we have a goal as a district to um, decrease behavioral events across every school and program by 3% each year. And so we have several tactile steps related to that that's all founded in MTSSB. And so really being an integral part of the district strategic plan of action and prioritized at that level has really made it so we're able to communicate outside of just student and community services with the other departments to think about how are we all aligning time, energy, and resources to kind of work together toward these same similar goals? So some of the things I'm just even within this year that I've been here that we're doing um, is our MTSSB um, kind of small department, myself, we've been meeting with other departments and other sections of o Omaha Public Schools, a couple examples. Um, meeting with the executive director of school improvement to think about if a school has reached the point of school improvement, what are we looking for within MTSSB? What does success criteria look like? How do we help support them and the teachers to implement those practices? In curriculum and instruction, um, some of our elementary schools are working on the children's literacy initi initiative. And within that, it has some climate and culture pieces. So it's okay, how do we make sure we're using similar language across curriculum instruction pieces that are touching on climate and culture and within MTSSB? We've also worked really hard, um, much like Jane said, thinking about professional development and how do we get the same message out to all of the different groups that are meeting in the district. So we have um, a behavior management team within student and community services, and we've really provided professional development this year um, to a number of different groups. So looking at new principals, our deans, um, assistant principals, we're on their agenda for next week's meetings. Um, we have a group of school support liaisons that work um, across multiple buildings to help with different pieces related to attendance um, and behavior due process pieces. So really professional development with all of these different groups on how are we gonna reach our strategic plan of action and what does that look like? And I think even that simple piece of everyone across the district hearing similar messages about MTSSB and us working toward common language and common goals is helping us get more aligned. Now, obviously we're a large district, there are a ton of different things happening and so it's always a goal, but those are some of these um, steps that we're currently taking to kind of work toward that alignment. You're a large district, you know, Renee, to kind of use your description of Muskegon Heights, we're kind of somewhat polar opposites, if you will, how did you, you know, even being the superintendent, that executive level leader, how did you work to encourage alignment? Yeah, so um, really what we tried to do was look at everything through that PBAS framework along with MTSS. So really looking at what are we gonna do tier one and then how are we going to inspect what we expect, right? What is the, what is the data point that we're going to, to gather? And I think there are two main data points that really helped us lunge forward. 
Um, one was that we as a central office team divided up all of our staff, everyone is, was assigned a number of people to touch base with quarterly. And every time we, we talked with them quarterly, we tried to frame them as more informal conversations, but we collected data and we asked four questions. Um, what's working? What are you doing? And, and it maybe it was PBS, maybe it wasn't, but what is working for you? Um, the second question is what's something that needs attention? What, what should we be focusing on? The third question is who is somebody who's helped you? And we use that as part of our, our shout out of staff who was doing well to model um, recognizing what was what was going well. And then the fourth question, because we were, um, we're a district that struggles with retention at one point in time, my first, well, three years in the district, we were experiencing a 50% turnover of staff annually. And yeah, yeah, so we really, it was necessary that we changed that climate so that people felt like they were being heard, that they were being appreciated and that they could then recommend. So the fourth question was, who's somebody that you think could join in this work with us that would fit well within our work? And then we would take that data back, analyze it as a team, do the shout outs to recognize people who were um, supporting other others, which also helps with retention when you can build that support system. Um, so that that really helped us in, in some ways with alignment. And then the other piece that I think was really important was that we struggled at the beginning to really have our staff embrace um, positive recognition of, of student behavior. It just wasn't a part of the culture. Frankly, it was um, um, not something that we were used to doing. And there was, I think, some question about whether it was really worth it or a good practice or... Um, so we took a different approach and we said we are going to do some merit based pay based on staff that recognize students um, appropriate behavior and that can really model that five to one positive interaction. And so we also divided up, we went out and we did observations of staff and they knew, they knew we were coming, they knew what we were looking for. And um, we took data on what those interactions were and the first time through it was frankly kind of painful. Um, we weren't even close to what we wanted to be, but the critical part of that work was to give feedback to our staff. So everyone received feedback. They knew they would be observed at least two more times prior to the end of the year, and at least um, to be able to earn that merit pay. And what we saw was a quick, change in behavior. And that quick change in adult behavior and recognizing the positive student behavior changed the climate. Um, and we found that we needed to kind of keep that going and keep touching touching base and doing those periodic, but it was, it was not a surprise for the staff, right? We lay out expectations for students. We lay out expectations for staff. This is what we expect. Here's how we're going to monitor it. Here's how we're going to acknowledge and reward it. And here's how we're going to correct it. So we just applied the same concepts and um, that really helped move us forward. I'm really curious of hearing, hearing more though um, from other districts because I'm always now moving into this state role, you know, looking for ideas to be able to share out. So Paula, you wanna share what you guys did? Um, sure, so for us, um, let's see, it came in two different phases, one out of necessity, but then when we got when we were awarded the school climate transformation grant that really happened naturally where we had to develop the goals and they had to align with uh, what our district was doing but so their components um our center administration definitely bought into it our superintendent our assistant superintendents bought into it they knew it was the right way to go and so it was an all communication Everything that they talked about, every meeting they held, they made sure they had the language of uh, the framework or the, the Mustangs being all one. Um, it was always referred to. I think that the other big push that I saw that made it align, um, that, that, was, that really brought some, some of this to light was our community involvement and our parent and community involvement. So a lot of our teaching staff our former alumni. It's it's really, when I tell you it's traditional here, it's very traditional. So folks stay within the community and go on to teach here. So as they were hearing it in their buildings and as it was 
it, as it was cascading down from central admin, they were also hearing it from their teams as a, as a parent, as a guardian. And so they were experiencing it from two different lenses. And it, that was really, really cool because we, we did see those stars align. And um, so that was, that was definitely helpful. I mean, we have a welcome center where folks register, right? Where new families register. Uh, uh, the, the framework, as, as they register, they leave with a brochure on what, what's pertaining school, uh, what their framework looks like. It's embedded in a lot of our um, everyday language, just everyday norms and all of our goals. So it came in a, in a, in a myriad of ways. Um, so that's that's our end of it. Um, Jane, what are what are your some of your thoughts on that? Well, um, one of the things that I was thinking about when when I was listening to others share their ideas um, about ways to like build that collective efficacy across a district, um, and some of the things that we have done um, in in my district are, for example, like with our universals, we aligned our language district-wide. So now across every school in our district, um, we all use SPARC, which is, which is the acronym for all of our, you know, words. And, um, and we decided that, first of all, that could potentially harness some collective efficacy district-wide amongst staff, but it also could make things a lot, um, a lot, um, simpler for students and for families. Um, and we do have students who move from building to building. And when they go from one sp space to the next, their, their, universe, their understanding of universals essentially will remain the same. And then also for families, and we do have a lot of families with multiple students in multiple different uh, schools. And so um, there's some power in being able to leverage some alignment district wide across um, all different school sites and, um, and spaces while still giving each individual site some autonomy to um, shape it to the age of their students, to the mascots of their building, to their school's culture, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it's like kind of that fine balance between de determining and developing what can be um, unified as a district and what can be personalized as a school. Um, and, and so, and I, I would say that, you know, you might think, oh, having the universals the same is a very small step, but with a lot of those different pieces, they add up. They really, they really end up um, kind of um, weaving a strong district-wide foundation. And, and since it is somewhat of a small step, it's not too challenging to accomplish. You could, you could tackle that and then uh, and really um, fortify your, your, your foundation um, with, with a early win in the process is what I was thinking. I'm curious to hear from all of you because you've, you've talked about your journeys, you know, it's a continued journey to align all the things. What we often hear when we start working with districts is, well, I can't do PBIS. I'm, our, I'm doing all 22 other letters of the alphabet. I don't have room for these four. How have, what have been those conversations that you've entered into to help people understand that you know, we're really not trying to do one more thing. We're trying to think about how do we bring this in in the best ways possible? Because I love that word Jane used, leverage. And so how have you kind of entered into those conversations where there's a little bit of resistance to, to doing what could be termed one more thing? Chelsea, well, I'll um, kind of start this and then we can bounce around. I think one of the things, um, that we have to be conscious of and continually having conversations of is it's not one more thing. We're building a framework to support students. And I think that everybody in buildings right now, you know, not only within Omaha, but everywhere, we're 
doing many things to respond to challenging behaviors or seeing challenging behaviors. And so this isn't necessarily one more thing. It's more of how do we implement evidence-based practices and use our data to use the small limited amount of time, energy, and resources that we have in ways that are efficient and effective. And so I think sometimes it's stepping back to you're already doing a ton of things for behavior. Um, so how do we, instead of doing one more thing, get more strategic about the things that we're doing, um, align them in that framework, think about prevention. Um, you know, all of our buildings and programs are implementing tier one to some degree, but it's that reminder of when we get caught in continuous response to behavior, how do we take a step back and think about how is the system set up? How do we go back to prevention? So I think it's even putting it into those terms of, you're already responding to behavior, whether you're using this system or not. And this is about using this framework to be more strategic so that we can increase the likelihood that we're successful and sa save time, energy, and resources later. So sometimes it's just continually having that conversation because we can get lost in the moment of all the things that are happening and it feels like one more thing, but if we're really intentional, it doesn't have to be. It can be the way that'll save us time, energy, and resources in the long run. Taking some, taking some time to explicitly point out um, the um, similarities and, and crosswalk between PBIS-oriented things and instructional things is a strategy that I try to use um, and, and that the makers team tries to use like those, for example, the eight effective classroom strategies that we all know are research-based, PBIS promotes, Makers Team has done quite a bit of work around those. There is a lot of, of, um, of crosswalk between, in Missouri, the Missouri indicators for our evaluation system and the eight effective classroom strategies. So you can, you can have those items side by side and say, we have to do our um, evaluation system. We know that these are effective. Oh, look all of these elements in PBIS effective classroom strategies are also found in our evaluation system. So we're going to do it together and, and really try to get everything going in the same way. Be, being explicit about pointing out those commonalities for people. So Jane, um, and um, and Danielle, we, we definitely see it from that same lens. And what I, what I like to do with, especially during the coach networking sessions, at the onset of our school year, we, it started off uh, as it, like I just cheesy model of the triangle. And I had every team, um, every coaches, because they co-coached, every coach uh, um, in the building um, identify what levels of support they naturally have in their building and ha and I had them write it along the triangle, right? We've seen this before. Um, it, it developed into a written piece, but what was really cool is they took that turnkey um, the information to their team and then their staff disseminated it uh, in multiple staff meetings um, throughout the first month, month and a half. Um, this was particularly helpful for when schools were originally rolling out, like their first year of rolling out after their um, training year. And I think that it helped folks really see it as the umbrella under which everything is housed under. You know, we use that analogy as well. But that was an activity that helped drive that point for us. And I would just jump in and say that if it, Muskegon Heights was probably very unique in the way that um, our teachers knew that we needed to do something different. They, they knew that our children needed more and that we weren't really, really reaching them to the extent that they deserved. And so they were ready. I, I literally never had somebody say it's one more thing. I, people were just like, tell us how, tell us how, which is so unique in any experience that I've ever had. Um, and then because, so there's always a silver lining because we turned over 50% of our staff annually, once we built the framework, um, it just became who we were and what we did. So as we hired new staff, 
we worked with our onboarding system to say we have two weeks of PD prior to school starting and we framed that onboarding to say this is how classrooms are set up here. This is how um, how classroom management happens here. And so we just made it part of the system. And so in, in some respects, I think it, it might have been easier in that way. I love how you said you made it part of the system. And, you know, Paul has talked about, you know, we have a coach network and Jane's talked about, we have a maker's team and Danielle's does, you know, identify that each building in Omaha designates a coach. So you've got these people that are helping you promote and lead and progress and support. But I, I want to pick up on something that Renee said, you know, Renee's used the word turnover. And that's something that all districts encounter at some point in time be it large turnover one semester, one year, small the next. So when you think about bringing new people into your district, how do you make sure that you've got the right people to do the right job, given everything you've shared with us today? You know, where is PBIS experience or knowledge or skill? How is all of that part of either your hiring practices or your, your performance expectations? Jane, what's it like in uh, Ferg Ferguson Florissant? So um, in Ferguson Florissant, you know, we have been recently, we've been able to leverage some of our ESSER funding and title funding to open up some new positions, which I'm sure is happening in a lot of places. And so um, that has those with, with that opportunity, it's allowed us to um, focus on seeking some candidates with some expertise in um, areas related to PBIS, which has been um, which has been kind of a unique new venture for us. Like we were able to hire school social workers and and some of our buildings are are in the process of hiring a restorative um, room teacher and those kinds of things. And so so that's been kind of cool that we've been able to, um, craft some um, job, some postings and job descriptions and really look for those kinds of experts in the field. Um, and then when it, when it is, when we're talking about um, hirings and, and coaching of teachers and um, developing those skills and practices, as a, um, as a principal in a building, I, I am looking um, less for, um, knowledge and, and, and um, expertise in the content and more for an openness and a willingness to be able to embrace the tenets of PBIS and to share um, in the philosophy and the belief in the collective e efficacy. Because I do think that when, with, when people are provided um, the right support and the right training, as long as the mindset is open and there, then it can happen, right? So, um, so that's really my more, more of my approach when I'm, um, when I'm working through the hiring process, like on a school level for our district. So it's kind of a combination of both, I would say, that are going on right now for us in Ferguson Florissant. Paula, for Clifton, how are you all addressing workforce capacity? So we, we do um, have it in some of our job postings, in particular around um, counselors, social workers, administrators. We haven't quite gotten to the teaching postings yet. Um, so that's that on, our, on that point. Our, during our... Um, our interview questions, our interview panels, they certainly ask about um, PBSIS overall knowledge, experience, or how they've overcome challenges if they come from a pre existing experience with PBIS or PBSIS. Um, also, our, our our evaluation tool for teaching staff, we use Charlotte Danielson evaluation, right? So um, during our administrative retreat in August, we, we talk a, lot, uh, a little bit about how uh, administrators can pull from domains one, two, or three during their evaluations to look for some of that content uh, around PBSS. But we're certainly uh, have a lot more work to make it all unfold. 
right? Because there's still a lot of work around that um, to make it standard practice in our district. I think we had a similar experience where we um, didn't necessarily have people coming in with the, the knowledge, but when, when we interview, we look for people who could tell us a story. We always had um, that as part of their interview question. Tell us a time where you faced um, adversity or somebody tried to stand in your way to get something done. Because what we were looking for was really the people with the, the capacity and the um, stick to itiveness to, to do what they knew they needed to do. And then once they came on board, then we work through the onboarding system of this is how we do it. And, um, and this is where the system is. And then I think the other critical point in that is the feedback loop. So um, for us, it was through evaluations as well. And for everyone, um, our central office evaluations, how are you supporting systems in the buildings? And we each, um, each central office member had a principal team uh, or principal that they mentored and that they did side by side with. with. And as we did walkthroughs for the principal completing their evaluations, looking for those elements in the evaluation, making sure that we were seeing the same thing. And so we could coach the principal along with just checking to, to make sure that we saw, saw things in the same way, a fidelity check, if you will. And um, then that when in, it's in the teacher evaluation, it's in the um, administrative assistant evaluation. So how are students um, interacted with and families interacted with when, when they come into the office, because it's, I mean, that's the first place and the uh, almost the spokes, um, what represents the whole school climate, right? Um, so we, we tried to implement it through everybody's evaluation system in that way and including that they, that they get those feedback loops because we can't expect people to just know or to read a rubric and, and interpret what that means the same to everyone so that they could get the feedback loop then um, go practice and then continue to get more feedback so that we could grow together. And just to kind of take that, what Renee said and take it a little deeper, I've always had, you know, I think all of us do this philosophy prior to this position that we can't expect people to implement things if there aren't systems in place to support them. So when we think about teachers in the building implementing MTSSB or PBIS practices, if we have, just like we think about with students, if we have a large number of teachers that are struggling to implement it, when we look at data across the board, how do we as a school building work to really create systems and structures that help support them to do it? And so that's one of the things that we're looking at across the district now is how are teachers doing with implementation of some of our MTSSB practices at the classroom level? And if we're not implementing, how do we then as a building team help support implementation? What systems might we need to put in place at the building level to increase the likelihood that they're able to do it successful. But then I also think at the district level, we have to take that same lens and approach. If we have schools, um, when we look across data, whether it's the TFI or the SAS or um, you know, behavior event data, whatever it might be, if schools are struggling, how do we make sure systematically from the district level that we're supporting that school? Do they have new um, administrators, significant new staff? And so we really take the approach um, here in Omaha that I heard others say about that onboarding process. How do we, one, make sure anybody new that's coming in gets kind of caught up to speed on what is MTSSB? What are your responsibilities related to your role? in the building or the district, but then always taking that step back of if someone's not implementing certain pieces or if a building's not, or we're struggling at the district level, why? And is there a system that's not in place that we can help promote use of those effective practices? I gotta tell you, you all have been so well received today. There is lots of love coming through in the questions and people are so appreciative of all these these examples and ideas and nuggets that you've left with. Um, so as we, we start to kind of move into our final few minutes, before we forget, I definitely want to say thank you so much to all the panelists here today um, to bring their rich experiences and their rich stories. And before we move into the participant Q&A, because there, like I said, there's been a lot of different questions that have come in and people kind of want to know and pick your brain, so to speak. If you're attending today's session, be sure to check out the files section in Pathable. 
you'll see there that there is a resources and links document for the entire district strand. And in that, you've got lots of resources. One of the things we've mentioned several times is a district systems fidelity inventory. Not only are you able to access that, you're able to access the guidebook that goes along with that, that our team here at the University of Missouri uh, spent the past few years authoring. There's a unique chapter for each section of the DSFI. So if you take the DSFI, you get your results, you can go to the guidebook and learn and grow as a district leadership team, start to forecast your next moves and your next steps. Speaking of that, shout out to Jane and Paula. They've uploaded and shared with us and all of you their district's action plans that go along with the DSFI. That's oftentimes what we hear is, can I see an example of what this looks like? Thank you so much to you representing your districts for sharing your action plans. And then we've also got training slides that are in draft and pilot form that our team here at the University of Missouri authored. So if you're curious to dig deeper into the DSFI and start building the capacity of, say, your district leadership team, there are training slides that you can use to help people understand the content at a deeper level. Um, but let's definitely go to some of these questions that have come through. And so the first question that came through was related back to building that continuum of support and specifically tier two. So anybody um, can feel free to pick up the question. We're just kind of curious, how did your district or how does your district determine school readiness for tier two when it's time to start implementing or that the building's ready to? I'll, I'll be brief and start and then somebody else can jump in. Um, Omaha Public School has actually adapted Missouri school-wide PBS's tier two readiness checklist um, and National Center also has one. So looking at data at the building level, um, some of the data indicators that were reviewed here were the school's tier one, scub, um, tier one score and the tiered fidelity inventory. Um, staff's perceptions of implementation through the self-assessment survey or the SAS. We also looked at the percentage of students that were receiving zero to one office referral, um, hoping for around 80% so that if you ended up at tier two, you didn't have a significant portion of students needing additional supports. And then we also looked at, um, is the tier one team using data to make decisions? Um, so again, we used that and it kind of had cut criteria, but then it also came down to discussions with buildings about, um, you know, how do you feel ready? And honestly, there were some buildings within a district who would meet readiness criteria one year, but they even self-selected to say, you know, we're getting a new admin, we're moving into a new building. I think it might be best if we wait so that we can increase success. Um, so it took over the course of two years for all of our schools and programs to move into even beginning implementation of tier two. Danielle, I appreciate you talking about a readiness checklist and how not that goes back to creating that system to support staff and to support all buildings. Renee, our next question, um, I'm gonna toss it to you because it, it taps back to what you mentioned earlier when you said merit pay. Can you define for us um, what, that, what that is, what that looks like? Because it kind of speaks to the larger topic of funding. How do we fund this work? Sure, absolutely. Well, for us, what we did was we worked um, what we called best practice pay into our Title I funding. Um, and so because we were a district-wide title district, 100% um, uh, of our students are it's direct cert. So we serve breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack. Um, and so for us, we had some funding that we could use in that way. And we identified multiple best practices and then put in a system of evaluation and feedback. And um, I, I think it was about a, about a half percent per item in this best practice pay that teachers could earn if they if they scored effective or highly effective in those particular areas so we just we just included it in that and i think that was definitely one of the advantages to being the superintendent um, and involved in this work because i was able to align budget to it it was our priority and so my first year um, as the superintendent i went through line by line every item in the budget and if it didn't fit um, specifically the plan that we are trying to implement, which we were very fortunate to be supported through um, Michigan has a uh, Michigan MTSS TA Center, and they um, really took us under their wing and 
helped us develop this entire plan. And then we, I just went through the budget and said, okay, that that's cool, but it's not something that's directly aligned. And so we're going to get rid of that and be able to support these initiatives more thoroughly. You know, you use that word alignment again, and that's um, something that came through the que the questions and the answers. And it pertains to just that topic. We often hear sometimes about, well, you know, my kids are my kids, and my community is my community. So, you know, that may be cool at the district level, but you know, here's how we do things on my campus, and each campus ends up kind of having the autonomy to do their own thing. You know, from anybody that's on our panel today what would you recommend? How could a district start to support alignment and move from you know, site-specific work and culture to more of a district culture? If I could just jump in real quick, because I think my response to that would be to push back and say, um, unless you live in the community and you have children in the community, I, I'd rethink that. This is not our school. It is our community school. And so what are we doing to align with the community desires? And if you bring your parents and your students to the table and, um, and then the, that message comes from them, then absolutely. But what we, what we saw was families across the district who, and somebody mentioned that earlier that they have multiple families with children across multiple buildings. And so I think sometimes as educators, we gotta be willing to, push back on ourselves and say, hang on, who are we really serving? And I would suggest that we're serving the, the children and the families. And when we do that and um, we do that well, we bring their voice to the table. And in my experience, then we have seen more alignment in, in what they desire because what one parent desires for their kindergarten kindergartner is ultimately to be independent and successful for their own goals. And that's the same thing that they're gonna desire across um, pre-K-12 education. Uh, one of the things that I think really helped us was I, I, I asked for administrative representation all along the way. So when I said that staff buy-in, I can't tell you the number, well, I can because of the annual report, but the number of focus groups, surveys, communication that, I, that was particularly sent to the administrators I, I, I think it was like, um, like just bringing each one of the silos as we as they like to sometimes think of themselves just together constantly. It happened over. Uh, so my first year here uh, officially was last year, but I've been working with Clifton in a different capacity for the last eight years. I think I've been chipping away at that slowly, but surely getting that communication all the time, their feedback. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Because in the end, some of the folks that held out were because for X reasons, but once they saw that those results and once they felt that connection, we brought them on board slowly, but surely. Well, we are a few minutes out from the end of our session. And so I cannot thank you enough. Again, lots of love, lots of appreciation coming through from the attendees today. And thanks for taking time to kind of let them pick your brains and get your perspective on those different questions. Um, our final question, we're just gonna do a rapid fire and we'll start with um, Jane and then we'll kind of toss it to Danielle and then Paula and then we'll wrap with Renee. Oftentimes people wanna know what's the secret sauce? If you can tell people one thing you wish you had known before you started, what would it be? Celebrate the small victories because the job is so big and you just have to keep it moving and celebrate the wins when you get them. Um, mine would echo what Jane said and then tack on to be patient. You know, there's a lot of work to do and there's an urgency to get it done quick, but the extent to which we can take it slow and build sustainable systems will increase the likelihood that we're able to help more students to be successful over time. Folks, it's going to take a long time. Like Kelsey said, think five, think 10 years. We're, we're, it, it, that's the truth to it. Five, 10 year spurts. That's what I learned. And in that same vein, I would say break it down so that you can see progress and success along the way and then celebrate it as Jane said, make it so it's one bite of the elephant. And then you can look for that, check the data, and then celebrate it when you get there. 
Well, thank you enough. I hope everybody on the session today will join me in a virtual round of applause and kudos and thanks to our panelists today. As we start to close out, uh, I encourage everybody to come back. Um, we're, we're moving into session two of the district leadership strand. Dr. Heather Hatton from the University of Missouri, along with some other district leaders that we'll have the opportunity to listen to and learn from, are gonna talk about evaluation and policy and dig deeper into database decision-making. So we encourage you to come back in 30 minutes for session two. Thanks again for joining us today for the district leadership strand and we wish you have we wish you a wonderful conference experience.